I have very few questions, and I'm going to make it even fewer by asking less of them. So for those of you who actually came tonight because you wanted to ask questions, I want your questions, and I'm warning you right now, after question number two I ask, these guys, I'm going to you guys for questions. So this could be a really short panel or a really interactive session. It's all up to you at this point. All right. You got my email, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you got, you're going to share, you're going to share my microphone and okay. pass it down. So there might be the one on the, oh, maybe, okay. I don't know if this one's, that one's So this is your path. Email. All right, Liza. Number one mistake startups make in approaching partnerships with brands. Having only men on their panel. for our partnerships and I, I was making my little things and over and over and over again all I wrote was add value, add value, add value because for so many startups that we work with and for so many brands that are looking for our partnerships, they're just looking to take value, um, which I think is super, super common. People looking for how other people can help them, which is super typical. I think a lot of times for us uh, as viewers to kind of meet someone and think about how they can help us. And it's a total turn off for any kind of brand um, to have a startup come to them or come to them and say, like, hey, I want to do a partnership with you. Let me tell you about all the ways that that would benefit me. So I think that the number one thing is to find a way to add value to your particular Good. Is that what you're asking? That's what <laughs> You did it, Liza. <laughs> Can I add? Keep going. Keep going. Everyone's, everyone's answering the same question. All right. Well, I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle. I work for I lead digital marketing at Nestle Waters, so Nestle is a big name. Um, I lead a portfolio of 14 beverage brands, including this one. Um, so not really drinking this. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I see on my front is assuming a big brand means big money right away. So um, big name. There's, uh, if, even if we are a big company, there's a lot of people working for that big company and a lot of brands, and every brand has their dollars allocated as you do for your own business. So even a big brand has lots of little pockets of budgets, and all those dollars are already assigned. So kind of understand um, on that and that the, the funds are kind of allocated and protected and, and um, have got to be accounted for just like anyone else accounts for for um, for your business, if you're a small business or if you're a big, big business, um, we still need to figure out, we treat our dollars like um, they're our own dollars. So um, just keep that in mind, because there's lots of people who have lots of, uh, lots of hands on those dollars. So you breaking Twitter news. You have budgets <laughs> and you have to adhere to them. Oh my gosh, okay, sorry. Um, so the biggest mistake I see brands make is not think about who their customer is and how they can align themselves with other brands that will further fulfill you know, a similar brand promise and go after a similar customer but not compete for wallet share. And so I see mistakes like in our pop-up shops, all of them sell handbags. Well, now you're all competing. Um, or they pick brands just because they're available, but they're not servicing at all the same kind of customer. One might be going after a customer who's a male at 20 right out of college that wouldn't spend more than $100, and the other brand is going after men in their 30s to 50s that make an income of $200,000 a year and they, they expect a more high-touch luxury experience. So when you're going to partner, it should elevate and further the message that your brand sends, and if your partners don't help deliver that, then it is a mistake because it's confusing to the customer that you're inviting into your space. So the ladies to my right have been pretty much spot on. Just to add to that, one thing that we see a lot at Verizon is being a very large company, $130 billion in revenue or something like that. Do you have budgets? <laughs> we do. We do. Surprisingly. No, but one thing that we find a lot is that startups come to us and say, you know, together we can make, you know, $15 million. Well, so for a startup, that's, that's great. That's great. You're making $15 million. That's excellent. But for us, you know, $130 billion in revenue, $1 billion in revenue isn't even going to move the needle one percentage point. 
So if you think about it in terms of scale, we're looking for opportunities that, you know, over a five five year period of time, we can create some sort of hypothetical one billion dollar market opportunity for us. Now, is that realistic? I'm not sure, but that's what we're really looking for. We're looking for the two plus two equals ten scenarios. So with our assets and your assets, what can we do together that can really accomplish something big for us? All right, um, I'll tell you from the experience of an e-commerce company. Um, so a big mistake is talking to, and this is some people out there being like, well, if this ever happened to me, I'd have it made. Talking to the CEO or president of a large brand or a large media company or partner X, whoever that may be, and thinking, because they say, we want to do this with you, we're going to do this with you, I promise you, and introduce you to the entire executive team, <laughs> thinking that that means this is going to be a successful partnership. Um, this happens a lot with big conglomerates, where there might be a large strategic objective uh, across multiple properties or multiple brands, and that doesn't quite get translated further down, or even if it does, you get into the partnership and you realize, oh boy, uh, the people I'm working with just don't understand what deal we struck, or the CEO said this, and you end up uh, wasting a lot of time, which as a startup means you're wasting a lot of money. Um, so that's a really big thing to watch out for. You really need buy-in up and down, and even then it's not a guarantee, but you really gotta pick carefully. Don't be fooled because you didn't go out and have to pitch and close that partnership yourself. And then it's just coming to you that, uh, that it's worth spending resources on. Um, just so I want to take the mic with you for a second, um, Matt. When you were negotiating, because we often talk about how people can work with, startups are looking to work with big brands in the U.S. and break into the U.S. market. You were doing the reverse. You were negotiating brand partnerships in Asia. Yeah, we had kind of two things going on. One, our you know, BelahaLife.com marketplace, um, we got a lot of interest from Asia. And um, so we did partnerships with Rocketon, with VIP Shop, um, because they're trying to get luxury brands in Asia. And everybody knows about Alibaba's IPO, trying to court uh, brands here in the West. Um, and that's, that's a case where you really have to be just clear, because you probably don't have a presence in Asia, I'm assuming. Um, you know, again, there's going to be top, you know, there might, the senior management, whatever company you're working with, might have uh, large goals. You got to be able to break that down so that you start off in a way that's manageable for that company to work with and that it's not going to require, the more hands you have uh, in the pot, it's, it's just, especially overseas, it's incredibly hard. So we actually had, I would say, a decent amount of progress, but it's really a five year plan. If you want to get into Asia, in any way, like just you don't have a five year plan, like just don't don't have lofty goals. I'm gonna say how are we gonna do that if we're gonna exit in two, but I'll quick my sarcastic comments to a minimum. Um all right. We got two mics, we're going crazy now. Um all right, I'm gonna ask this question and I know I'm thinking about this with particularly uh, Liza and um, Melissa, given your um, expertise in working across both with startups with, and with brands, kind of answer it the way you think, you know, kind of like what's kind of top of mind. And it was a question I emailed to all of you, like what do brands look for in partnerships with startups? Uh, and um, right now, I think it's sort of right here, right now, what are the things that you think should be top of mind? And, and you know, if Kim or, or um, Shona, you want to, you know, start the conversation going, like right now as you think about your business, and what it is that is most helpful to growing and, and entering market share or expanding market share, what is it right now that's most important, you think, in, 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 in those kind of brand partnerships? I want Melissa to answer this first, but first I want to say that Melissa is one of the smartest people I know when it comes to pop-ups. I paid her um, to say that. <laughs> it's not true. She is an award-winning pop-up show producer, and when we were hearing a little bit about pop-ups, earlier and I just kept hoping and wishing that Melissa was up here asking, mm -hmm. answering some of these questions because she's a badass when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> so with that intro, it's going to be a great answer. <laughs> no, no pressure. No um, <laughs> what was the question? No. Um, so I, I think it goes a little further to what Kim mentioned as well. So 
we work with startups and we work with brands. We've done stores for brands that literally just launched their website and then we've worked with larger brands like Marc Jacobs. And when we work, well, I'll put that Marc Jacobs in that brand category versus startups, it's about furthering the experience a lot of the times or it's about getting into a market niche that they don't already have an into. So you'll see that with larger brands, maybe they want to go after the 40 plus market and they really resonate with a different market and they found this startup that has this core loyal following that they want to be able to get into. Well, partnering with this startup is going to help them get there. Or they want to further the experience. Um, we're working, I can't name it, with a UK retailer that's going to be coming in for a pop-up store. And they want to be able to show the different looks that they're going to do. They want to bring over all their inventory. So they're going to partner with a really great technology startup that allows for augmented reality and virtual fitting rooms and so that they can catalog the pieces and it furthers the extension of the space so they can fill, still give a full offering, but they're going to be integrated with this really cool innovative technology that's also going to give them data. And that works because their market that they're going after is digital natives. So they're right out of college and high school and they are tech savvy, so that partnership works really well. So I think if, if you think of those two aspects when you're pitching a brand to partner with you or vice versa, then you can leverage a lot from the relationship. Well, what was the cluster of, of companies that you brought together for the Mark Jacobs Daisy Chain a year ago? Uh, so for the for Mark Jacobs did, uh, for the Daisy fragrance, it was a tweet shop. So you can only pay with social currencies, whoever wasn't able to go. So already you know this is going to be a digital experience. Um, so we brought in a photo booth company that was able to grab images from the cloud as long as it was hashtagged. And since that's the way you pay, everybody coming in there was using this hashtag. They didn't take up a lot of room. It was these small sets that we could fully brand. Anytime somebody posted a picture, they can go to the machine, touch the screen, print it out. At the end, and people love that experience, but at the end, we also had more data. How many people came in, how many of those people posted and printed, on which channels were most popular, was it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what was the word sentiment analysis around it? So it was giving them more data for their marketing campaign that they can use later. Maybe they identified influencers that didn't exist in their mind before. Um, maybe they thought that they should be on Instagram all the time, but Facebook's really active for them. Um, the other people we brought in just to add to the discovery element of the space, we brought in a solar-powered coffee trike that debuted for the first time from London, and it sat on a bicycle. Um, Langley Fox Hemingway was the artist, and we had DJ Jilly Hendrix spinning, uh, and she was on behalf of Songza. So all of them cater to a similar audience and elevated the experience. So can I go back to your question you were asking about what, what are people looking for? I mean, I think one of the things obviously is revenue, right? But I also think it's really intimidating for some people that are running startups to think about like, oh yeah, 50 million to me would make my year. I can't even fathom what it like to a billion dollars, <laughs> right? Yeah, that would be so I can exit, thank you, you know? But I think the stuff that Melissa's talking about is really illustrating what are the other kinds of value that you can bring to a brand besides generating revenue. So maybe I have a specific audience that I can bring to a brand that, that is kind of peripheral to what they're doing or tertiary and I can help them kind of move into that new kind of audience. Or more specifically about that data that you can collect by having different types of partnerships, so whether it's online partnerships or offline partnerships. So knowing that kind of stuff, you're talking about which social channels are more important to us than we didn't realize before. That's really helpful information to bigger brands to try to understand who are my influencers, um, where are people talking about me, in ways that they weren't able to look at before. And a pop-up shop is a really good example where you can do that in a brief period of time at a relatively small amount of budget. You can get a lot of information, have a lot of influence, and, and in that case, have a lot of press based around this kind of relatively small thing that you're doing. Thoughts? Mike, what do you what, 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 like right now in terms of your thoughts and, and looking ahead, sort of 2015, 2016, what are you looking for? So really right now what we're trying to do is source innovation outside of the walls of Verizon, which is very difficult. We're a very large, slow-moving, risk-averse company, highly regulated telecom company, right? There's not a whole lot of innovation that's happening in the four walls of Verizon, but we're trying to change that, right? And I think a lot of Fortune 100 companies are doing the same. We want to be immersed in the startup ecosystem, but how do we do this? So 
one thing that I think is really scary for startups and can be intimidating is for us, our bargaining chip is for one, our brand, and two, our ability to scale. Well, what's the bargaining chip for a startup? Um, it could be a number of things to Liza's point. It could be gathering this data, um, you know, big analytics type of things that are very, very in the forefront of our minds right now. We're trying to figure out how to get into analytics. Mm -hmm. Startups could be a key component of that. Secondly, I think just overall IP, I think large companies really look to startups to source new innovation, whether that's your technology, your capabilities, or your general know-how. So things like that, you've got to think of a new way to spin it. Um, but definitely, there are always, always new, new things that we're looking for. In terms of startups, we want to be involved, but we're trying to figure out what the best way to do that is and how to work with young companies and try to bring it within the four walls of Verizon, like I keep saying, it's very difficult. And we just started a new organization called the New Product Development and Innovation Organization that does just this. So how is a large company going to work with a startup community? That's what we're struggling with and that's what we're trying to figure out. So we'll see. Hopefully within the next year or so, we'll, we'll get much better at this. Uh, I can ident definitely identify with that. So. Um I, I'm a separate business that unit. Is it? Yeah. Not that I wasn't fun to hear you cut us down. I trust you. I trust you. Um, yeah, same, same here. Um, as Kim mentioned, is that working? We have got to be like dead on. Go right. off our group. All right, just let so me know. Right. The audience is doing a job now. <laughs> 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 um, I think, you know, we have hundreds of brands. Thousands of brands, and we are challenged with being a more traditional based company. So, big names sometimes have been around for a long time. Um, some of our brands do have big budgets, but we don't know, and we are trying to evolve as an organization, as brands. How do we become better, smarter marketers? How are we trying to reach consumers where they're, not, where they're communicating, purchasing, whatever these days? And we don't know how to do it. You know, we are trying, we are learning from. Startups, we're learning from everybody who's bringing these new ideas. But oh, oh I shouldn't admit this, but um, I've been in my my fitness and water now for over three years, and I really don't know my phone number. I, I never answer that phone. I, I know my mobile number, but I do not know the, the phone number of the, the phone in my office. Um, it rings all the time, and it's um, you know the voicemails are full. Point is, there's lots of people trying to contact you. So how do we get our arms around who the heck to talk to, um, and who's going to provide us with value? Because we can't talk to everybody, but we want to talk to people. We want to learn. Um, and I don't think there's a little thing. Hey, what's in my mind right now? We are trying to do a lot of things. There's a lot of brands, and it really comes down to solving various objectives. So it's not just about revenue. It's about um, uh, for Poland Spring, I have certain objectives, and for um, San Pellegrino and Perrier, I have different, uh, different needs. So I may be launching a new product. I may be trying to market um, Perrier, which has been around for years and years, but it's been known to a certain, certain target segment, and now we're trying to target millennials who don't consider Perrier, and then we're trying to market to them in a certain way. So I guess um, it's, not a, it's not a particular thing we're looking for, it's any set of things that help us be smarter marketers. So I need to take a look before approaching, I guess, a, a brand, um, kind of take a look at what that brand or that business is trying to do um, and get a picture of who they're trying to reach, what marketing activity they're trying to engage in, and if you have a service or a product that will help us do that, then that's a good start. Instead of just mass pitch, here's what we do. Tailor what you're, what you're selling to what we need and talk to us about that. Now, given just your comment in terms of your voicemail and probably your email and all the rest of that kind of stuff, you know, what's the best way for a startup to pitch you? Is it to you directly or to somebody else? Or through somebody else? Yeah, that's, that's the tough part. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, and, and every organization is different, right? But if you can reach me, great. But, um, you know, I, I, the, the ones I do pay attention to are emails that come through that are not cut and paste, that show me that I've been looking at your brand and, you know, here's some images, or here's what we can do, here's how you can solve your problems. Then I'll look at that. Um, 
But you know, big companies also come with big process, and that's just the way it is. And we want to think we're small and, and nimble in our own ways, but we still have our ways of doing things. So if you can't find the right person, um, think about, do a little research and um, find out, for example, some brands and big companies work with a lot of agencies. I do, I have a sponsorship agency, I have ad agencies. So a lot of startups are trying to pitch new ways of buying media. We work with media companies, find out who the media company is and go through them. Um, a lot of uh, my digital my digital agencies who do a lot of digital creative for me, um, they're, I challenge them with coming up with great new campaigns for us. They've got to come up with uh, not just creative, but a cool consumer experience, and they've got to find partners for them to work with. So look for the partners um, as well as the, the direct contact. Can I add really briefly? Yeah. One of the one of the tiny little tricks that I've seen be the most successful for startups pitching brands, you just touched on, is make a mock up. It's so crazy. It's this if you put a graphic designer half an hour, an hour worth of time to put a mock up with the she said it changes everything. It's if you can put your uh, their brand logo on whatever product you're pitching and actually make them see it. It seems like such a simple, Every simple thing, thing, but people do it so rarely, and it's one of the main ways that we've seen people get in the door with the company, is to just make a simple mock-up. Matt, down at the end, with your, sure. all you um, say, your, your, <laughs> all your time building all these partnerships with us. And yeah, I mean, um, well, number one, in terms of like in the future, I think what's obvious to everyone, uh, retail and media are in absolute turmoil, right? So the number of opportunities that are coming from that, if you are a startup and you can find a way to, and I can just put it this way, plug a hole initially, um, that's what they're looking for. And, you know, the, the again, this will also sound a, a little bad, but let me tell you what I mean. The bigger the, the, the partner that you're trying to work with, uh, you know, the, the greater, um, you know, it is more proportional to how expendable you could be. And, and you need to, so you need to take that as, you know, if you're constantly working to get in front of big X partner, you know, the, the, the quicker that you get on board is as quickly as you can get off board. And so you, sh you need to be extremely careful with who you partner with. And that means you gotta spend the time doing the mock-ups, right? You gotta spend the time showing them actually how can you save something that they're afraid of losing, right? If it's technology that they don't have that they want to outsource, show them how you can do that and show them how you're gonna be the best at that. Don't, um, you know, you gotta get in there and actually start demonstrating value before you're asked to do it. Um, because what happens is you want, you need to basically become part of the fabric of that partner. And you, you, you know, absolutely should ask yourself, you know, do I see, do, whether or not you want to get acquired by that partner, you need to ask yourself, you know, if I'm doing this and my partner at some point wouldn't want to acquire a company like me, it's probably not worth doing because you're probably an experiment at that point. And as a startup, you don't want to be an experiment. And unless you can do it with minimal resources, you don't want to be an experiment. Um, so getting, getting in front of um, the right, you know, it's all about people, right? At the end of the day, you, the people that are working at these larger partners, their people try to judge, you know, is this somebody who I believe is going to be around the company in three years? If, if not, you got to you just, it's not worth talking to that person anymore because people turn over at companies. Some companies have more turnover than others. You want to, you want to understand the, the politics of what's going on there because you're, you'll get eaten up if, if you don't. So I hope that didn't all sound too negative. Um, it's just, it's just as a startup, you, you gotta, you gotta, you really gotta think about this stuff because it's just a lot of time and money. And, and, and look, nobody, there's nobody ill intention, right? Um, everybody, you know, who works at X Partner wants to make something happen, right? That's why they're talking to you. You know, everybody's well-meaning, but there are forces outside of everyone's control that happen. And the bigger the company, the more those forces are just, you know, not going to be able to stop. Them. That positive moment just did, didn't it? All right, I said I was going to ask two questions, and I was looking to you guys for questions, and I was like, kidding. Yes. Far away. Hi, how many, uh, how many uh, yeah, say stars have partnered with uh, in the last 12 months? Is that for Tim or? Tim or Sean? No, okay. Cool. Anything? 
I mean, Melissa, I think some, some, like, some of your brand, brand, like some of your brand, big brand um, pop-ups. I mean, you're clustering several opportunities there for you know emerging companies. So it's even thinking those ones. I mean. Yeah, um, I, I'm just I'm just a little curious in the audience of how many people have started companies. Okay, and then the rest of the audience is it. Uh, what kind of partnerships are you looking to pursue? Because I also want to answer in a way that would be helpful. So, are you looking to partner with events? Are you looking to partner? Are you looking to learn about like deep, deep partnerships? Like he's talking about, we could potentially be acquired. Like. I don't know how to find out yeah, the yeah, mix of the audience, but... Yeah, because the ones you're doing a lot are the brand activation. Right, so yeah, we're more on the brand activation side, so it's not as deep as a partnership, but who knows what can come out of it. So, you know, for instance, we're working with a male uh, menswear brand right now that I can't say yet because it's been announced, and we're doing a partnership as a pop-up in a hotel. And it turns out in the meeting we had today that they are in love with this custom fit that they're doing, and now we're gonna have lookbooks in all the hotel rooms, and we're gonna dress the staff. Oh, and they might stop working with the company that was dressing their current staff at the hotel, and now there might be a new partnership there. So it was just, just a little pop up that turns into to, more yeah, than hotel. exactly. Um, so, but I think that that happened, and I know that that happened because we picked a hotel in a location that was on brand to that brand as well. So. I would just you know keep going back to that, but throughout the year I can't name the number of startups because we work on both sides. We work with startups that just launched. We work with kind of mid-tier brands that are doing fifty to hundred million dollars, and then we work with the large brands. And throughout the year we're making strategic alliances and partnerships in the pop-up. Um, and the ones that do the best are to the point I said before that they're going after a similar customer and completing the experience that they're getting in the space. They're co-marketing with each other, and I would say that's a really important thing that you have in your agreement from day one. You have a space and you're inviting somebody to be in your space to co-host a night, know what you're getting back out of it too. They need to be obligated to invite their following or else you're not really getting anything out of it. Um, they should co-market it, um, they should send it through their newsletter. Um, it, and sometimes, uh, it's sometimes it's a tech partner, so it's, it's adding to the experience, but um, I don't know, we do it all year long, so I don't really have like, a number. And I'm, I'm thinking, so Kim uh, is, with Verizon is, is from Boston. I mean, Kim and I met because she's, I mean, when are you not on the road is really what I, really the question. But I mean, you're at meetups, you're at accelerators, I mean, even if you're not doing partnerships, you're, you're like constantly meeting emerging tech companies with right. a whole, I'm going to say, Verizon Rolodex in your brain. Is it, is it this person good for this? Could they be good for this? Would you have a partnership on this? What should I keep my eye on? Um, yeah, I feel like that partnership with service is kind of hard to define. I mean, I would say we do anywhere between dozens and hundreds over the course of the year, but we have a database of thousands of startups. So our business model at Third Way Fashion originally started with working for and with startups directly, but has morphed over the years to working directly with brands and helping them find the right kind of innovation, which a lot of times is helping them find the right startups, which frankly is a lot more fun. Um, because working with startups, it's like, hey, startup, I have to pay my bills, how can you pay me? So it's a lot more fun to have a large brand pay the bills and come to startups because they're like, I've got a large brand that wants to work with you. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff is fun. So it's a little bit nebulous and hard to define. We do demo days about once a month where we have uh, anywhere between like 12 and 16 startups come in and do like half an hour where they just show us like, here, this is what I'm working on. This is what I have going on. And we add them to our database and then we kind of have them, we have a little bit of mind share for them so that when it comes to working with larger brands, you can say like, oh, we just saw this startup. This startup is awesome. So, I mean, I don't think we're trying to avoid a specific number because it is just a little bit like undefinable what specific partnerships are. I mean, you know, maybe some, you said you do a few in a year. Um, it, it kind of just depends on, on what the definition of. Yeah, yeah no, and to her point, um, I don't know, have you ever read the Startup Playbook? Have you guys read that book ever? It's a good book, you should, you read it, okay. So the people who wrote that book, the writer and his co-writer, now have a company called Bionic. And that company launched because that book got so much attention and now big companies like Boeing, 
huge companies, hire them and say, can you teach us how to be nimble like startups? Can you teach us how to be innovative? Can you teach us what's going on out there and how we can partner with those companies? So there's definitely a demand out there, so much so a company launched just to specialize in it, and their clients are huge. But you just have to really be clear about your value proposition and how you're going to align that with somebody. I think it's also who defines himself as a startup, right? I mean, we have a fashion brand that we're working with that's on tap to a billion dollars, and they swear up and down, we're a startup within a startup. And I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea what startup life is like. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm so ready to make a check. You're not a startup. No, I mean, there's even a second someone to Guild Group recently who was like, yeah, we're just a fashion startup. You know, it's like, that's fine because that's one of those words like foodie. You know, it's like, I'm a foodie because I say I'm a foodie. I'm a startup because I say I'm a startup. You know, but some of the times it's like, I don't think so. <laughs> I can't give you a number either, but it's growing. And part of the reason why I can't give you a number is because I know who I work with directly, but behind the company that buys my media, that's their job to deal with, to, to go out and find other partners. So I would put them together with my IS partners with, with them, and then all of a sudden it grows and grows and grows. I can't tell you that it's significantly higher than what it was the year before and the year before that. And then what I failed to mention before when Kelly asked about like how do you get in touch, um, you know, big package goods companies, we're not where we need to be, but there's recognition that we're not where we need to be. So there's a lot of companies, including Nestle, who start out have, have created what we're calling Silicon, Outpo Silicon Valley Outposts. So we have a couple people who are based out there. I never get why they're just out there. Like, I'm innovating in New York. Yes, seriously. I'm making, I'm making a new job for myself, but um, that would be really fun. Um, but anyway, so there's now investment in people who are based there, um, and there's a, a group of people whose sole job is to find us the right partners. And again, like my when people who are working on a specific business, our job is for the business. We don't have time to be talking to all the partners that we would love to be meeting. So now they're putting people in place to help us find those, to help us weed through who the right partners for us are. And they could probably give you a number. <laughs> you scare us all. So for us, I'm not sure if I could put a number to it exactly either, but to give you an idea, our team is, I think there's eight of us, and we get probably anywhere from five to 10 partnership requests a week just on our team. Granted, there's 200,000 employees at Verizon, so the amount is, you know, exponential, <laughs> but how many our team specifically works with, and we work closely with the Ventures Group and other <laughs> corporate strategy groups within Verizon that are overarching in the wireless and the wireline side, because we're focused more on the non-core emerging technology within, you know, various vertical industries that are non-core to Verizon, so healthcare, energy, transportation. So we're looking at those types of startups. Um, so really, it can be, Anywhere with our team, you know, one to four different startups that we actually follow through with and try to start a partnership. Now, that doesn't mean that we actually, it ends up working out, but um, I probably, try. <laughs> yeah, we try maybe one to four a year. Next question. Woo! All right. Far away. Sure. So um, I actually, in the past, I worked for and reported to the chief medical officer within Verizon. Um, he's now the chief innovation officer as well, um, but he has a very extensive background in um, healthcare. He's an actual doctor. He's a physician, gone tech, gone tech guru, and he also is now a security guru. He sold a couple of companies, went to Verizon, but he also created Norton Antivirus that I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. Um, he was one of the founders of that, and he actually created it based on how a virus would attack the body, so he replicated that. Um, but to your question, I kind of got, got now the away from the question. <laughs> oh, he's, he's an absolutely brilliant guy. Um, I, I like talking about him. He's 
he's very fascinating. But um, we do a lot in the health IT spectrum. Um, our group was tasked to drive the overall healthcare strategy for the organization. Um, we are shifting roles to get further away from being healthcare oriented because our group was at probably last year we were 80% focused on healthcare. Now we're going to be more just generalized um, new emerging technology. So it might be reduced to maybe 20%. Um, but we do generally Series B, Series C. We have done some Series A. Um, we have done some very, very few seed, but we have to be very sold on that. But we generally do more along the lines of Series B, Series C. Um, and it really depends. It could be five million plus. Cool. There's a hand right over here. Yeah, so this question is to Liza, but you might all have a take on it. It might be a good example too. Is you mentioned partnering up different uh, startups, right? And so this one's specifically for me, but maybe you can have a broad <laughs> And so let's say there's a company, a fitness brand, fitness women's apparel, and they want to capture five thousand hungry women with this fitness program, have a fitness program, and they're just dying for apparel, but we can't provide it to them. So in your, in your role of this, is this something that you can come up with a value way to, you know, pair in this company with that? Okay. So, say again what, what your company does. It does a program or just clothes? We have a program, it's called Pink Gloves Boxing. So it's fitness boxing for women with a group that I give them personal development and empowerment. And so they go through this multi-year program, really good universities, but everyone's dying for a parent, and we haven't found a way to provide it. Oh, fantastic. So the question was that you just write a fitness program called Pink Gloves. Yeah, Pink That's Gloves. Awesome. Um, pink gloves and you're looking for an apparel partner. Yeah, okay, so the panel earlier was talking a little bit about the direct-to-consumer businesses and about brands that are looking at building direct relationships with consumers, which is something that is brand, brand new in the last 20 years, the ability to be able to do that, right? And there are some interesting fitness brands that are doing that. So Corey Vines is one of them, which is a fitness brand that's kind of similar to Everlane. I don't know if you guys follow them, but really kind of high quality stuff at a low price because they're making it, they're manufacturing it themselves and bringing it direct to consumers. So there's companies like that that I think would be fantastic partners. I mean, fitness is a really interesting one. I don't know if how many of you are net a porte shoppers. Anyone? Yeah, okay. So they just launched fitness as a vertical, right? Which is really interesting because they're super high end. So these are fitness clothes. And it depends. You said universities. So probably something like Corey Vines would be better than the brands of net a porte. So it's like a great case study to sort of say, like, Who's the, who's the audience? Who's the users? Right. What are the metrics? What are the data? And what, how would that be of interest to, you know? Where's the overlap? Yeah, and I think also, honestly, like getting out there is super important. Like, we did a, a wearable tech and connected devices event at Magic, the wholesale buying conference last year, and one of the women that came by, she was interested in wearable tech from the perspective of fabrics particularly fitness fabrics, right? I mean, when you're looking at fitness, there's some really interesting stuff happening at a nano level with fabrics, but also with connected devices and whatever. Fitbit's just the beginning, right? So there's a lot of people in a lot of these industries that are really trying to look at that. So I think getting out there and getting your name out there and letting people know that you're looking for those kinds of partnerships is really important. Because for some of these brands, they're brand new, they're kind of obscure, or they're even within larger companies like Intel or Cisco, and they're building this stuff kind of in-house. And it's really a matter of like getting out there, pounding the pavement, standing up in a meetup, being like, I'm looking for this, you know? I mean, you're on your way, right? That's great stuff. Maybe they need to drink some water. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, that, I, mean, that, I can keep that. That's, 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 that's actually, actually a great example, you know, and I see it all the time um, with startups who are on the Curious platform. They're a fashion brand. The first thing they say is, oh, I really want to work with Marc Jacobs. And it's like, hold on there, Tiger. Let's talk about this, right? Like, who go away from your product and say, who is using it, right? Who is your user of your app or you know, who's shopping on your website? Like, who is that person? And who else is like Melissa pointed out, who else is interested in that person? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And it might be a water company. And, and you know, you mentioned Cisco. I mean, when I think fitness, I think Cisco. But no, I don't. Like you just <laughs> mentioned, all right, they're doing some really cool stuff. So go 
some of it, I think part of it, and this is so glad that you asked the question, the first thing you do is you're like, here's what my product is. Go back to who's using your product. Mm -hmm. What is making that, particularly if you've got this consumer-facing company. Matt, you probably got it. You probably got it. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's, when, when you're a startup, right, the product market fit is probably pretty much there, but you, you know, you're still going down that, that path and you've got to be laser focused on right, where am I going and is this partnership going to add to that? And because it's very easy to get pulled, you know, this way or that way because you've got a larger part of it that says, hey, well, yeah, that sounds good, but what we really need is this. And you got to really think, like, is this, am I going to get pulled up to do this other side project or is this treat my product roadmap. It's there's never an easy, clear answer, right? But be as as you know decisive as you can about that, but be flexible, right? I mean there you might actually learn something about the market when you get out there and talk with partners that says, actually if we you know kind of shift the product roadmap a little bit this way, we're actually gonna hit something that's happening right now in retail or in media that people really need. Right, I'm looking at the time and I'm being <laughs> ultra respectful because Matt's fabulous <laughs> girlfriend agreed to change her birthday dinner, so we can do this now. Oh, no, no, now, now you're not going to get stares if you're like, why the hell are you even here? But, no, 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 because, no, 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 because you know, this is all. So if anyone's going to have a question for Matt, fire it now. You don't need to edit it because of me. Go. No, I'm just thinking, I, 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 your fabulous girlfriend, I'm really thinking about her, it's not you, buddy. I'd have your, your sitting and answering questions all night. So any other questions for Matt? Otherwise, he's got a birthday dinner. <laughs> wait up, wait up. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, other questions for this panel? There was other hands. Fire away. If a startup wants to approach another company um, for a partnership at the same time, they're concerned that after they disclose the ideas underlying the partnership, that other company could decide to just go ahead alone and compete with the startup. Can I answer right now what you shouldn't do? Do not ask them to sign an NDA. That is, it's like one of the most, have you been asked, ever? I think it's one of the, you have. It's like one <laughs> of the most space. horrifying things. Oh, I don't want to say it. <laughs> they won't do it, they won't talk to you. They won't do it, they won't, it's the same with the investors, right? Like they won't ever talk to you. But does someone else want to answer what you should do? <laughs> yeah, sorry, thank you. So the question was, if you are a startup and you want to pitch a brand, but you basically, you don't want your ideas to all in, how can you handle it? So I was saying what you should not do is, is ask for them to sign an NDA because that's, I mean, it depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'll answer and then I'd love to hear what you guys say too because that's a really good question. It's a concern that a lot of startups have. But I think that you should just let your concern just completely drift away and forget about it. Because I have a theory that ideas are worthless unless there's someone that's going through and is actually executing it and is doing it in a way that makes a lot of sense, right? So that concern, and there's a couple of examples that you hear about in business school about, you know, it's like, oh, what's Apple, what's IBM, or maybe it was the other way around, like show a product and then they stole it. There's these big ideas that people talk about that were stolen. It happens so rarely. The possibility that something like that is gonna happen is so small, in my opinion, and maybe you, dis you ladies dissent, like, forget about it. It's not gonna happen. Like, it's such a minuscule chance. What do you ladies think? Yeah, exactly to your point. I Really, we just always leave it up to just trust that we won't. It very, very rarely happens. And to to your point, asking for us to sign an NDA, I mean, we just flat out won't. We, I mean, even if we needed to, it'll take, you know, three months for us to do it. So, so. there you go. You worry about them stealing their idea. You've already heard it's going to take three months to get an NDA, and then probably yeah. six or eight months to negotiate something. So if you're really good at executing, you have a license point. Plus another two years to actually go to market. Yeah, just know you have your business, and you're trying to partner with someone who has a different business. Yeah. We're not trying to get into your business. We don't have the flip in time, just like you wouldn't want to start up the same business with the partner you're talking to. So I, as much as I would have the same concern if I was in your shoes, I will tell you that it wouldn't cross my mind to ever consider stealing that, a type of idea like that. But still a great question, because that is a concern that I think probably everyone in the room shares. No, and it, it, it is, you know, just speaking at a conference in Dublin, I mean, one of the 
panels that I moderated was looking at the Silicon Valley and its LBD ecosystems and what has made them successful. And some of that is exactly Liza's point that there's no original idea, right? So put my investor hat on, don't come and tell me you're the only one who's thought of an idea because I'm going to laugh my ass off and it'll be great. If I need to laugh that day, please come and pitch me that way because there's no original idea, right? It's all about the entrepreneur and it's all about the execution. And the communities, the startup communities and ecosystems that really thrive is when people are just you're throwing away the ideas. Like, I got this idea, I'm not working on it. Here, take it, take it, take it, right? And, and you need to operate that way. And you need to know if you really are that entrepreneur and you're going to be successful, it's all about the execution. All about the execution. All right, what are we doing on time? Do you have a question? We can do this. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I think this is a great panel, maybe, to get your point of view on this, about the kind of corporate fact accelerators, because there's so many now. Um, I, you know, I mean, obviously from RJ, but also like Mac Plus, like Disney, like Samsung, and Volkswagen, which is the newest one I heard. Um, how do you guys feel about that team on kind of supporting the new ecosystem, but also the startups wanting to get exposure that way? Is it just kind of more PR type of? Value, or is it actually a business in like all the time? Kim, do you have a Verizon company accelerator? I know you're involved with Mass Challenge and other things. Are you no. going that route for innovation, or are you, are you sticking with what's going on on the outside? To my knowledge, we're, we have no future plans to create our own accelerator. We do have um, various competitions and prizes where we give away, I think it's $6 million to um, various different startups within healthcare, transportation, energy. There's one other category, but I forgot. But <laughs> powerful answers. There you go. <laughs> did, did you submit? <laughs> really? Oh, congrats. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, to my knowledge, no accelerator in the plans. But to your point, they are popping up left and right, and I think a lot of it, you know, to your, exactly to your point. It, it, a lot of it probably is just PR and just kind of keeping the fingers on the pulse of innovation. Um, I think it's it's a great way to source new ideas, but um, those very early stage ideas are just ideas, and I think it's a great opportunity for large brands to be immersed within the startup ecosystem and try. I think a lot of it is this large learning curve. We don't know how to work with startups, so we're trying to figure it out. And, well, they're starting Accelerator, let's make one too, but... Um, well, we're basically thinking in a way it's a better way for your poor, you know, Silicon Valley outposts who are running around, going to every meetup and everything else. Maybe if we just bring it in-house, we won't have to run around so much, so... Yeah, exactly. Have them, have them, have them come to us. Exactly. Yeah. Are you a startup or a brand? I am kind of an Accelerator, uh, but we, I'm going to start this. Gotcha. I mean, I think that it can really benefit the brands. But I think that one of the things that concerns me is how much it can actually benefit the startups. Because it is great PR for brands, and it can be really good PR for the startups, too. And if there's access and relationships that are built within mm -hmm. the actual accelerator, then it can be really good for startups, too. But we're, I mean, honestly, when it comes to those kind of brand-based accelerators, we are in a gold rush right now but no one has found any gold, right? So there's a lot of these brands that are looking at, like, we need a lab, we need an innovation lab, we need a VP of innovation, we need an accelerator, we need this, you know? And some of them are doing it really well, but a lot of them are just doing it because they think that it's something that they have to be doing. And so, like I said, the very first thing, add value, add value. I think that the very best ones, and they make sense whether you're a brand or you're a startup, is if it's something that's adding value on both sides of the equation. Yeah, and that's to Liza's point of it being a gold rush. The gold rush of these companies wanting to have these accelerators that don't be on the other side of the gold rush, like I need to apply to this accelerator because that's going to be the right decision for me. So really do your homework and do your research of what other kind of startups have come out of that accelerator. What was the outcome? How many of them get funded? How much of your company do you own at the end of it? Um, so that you understand your trade-offs. There's some that are just great resources to build an advisory community. There's some where you will get some funding, but at X percentage, you have to think about, is it going to be worth that? Um, and then a lot of them, like the Samsungs of the world, I mean, you're developing in-house, and they're owning a piece of that, for sure. No, your voice. 
it was called an accelerator, but they were hiring experienced entrepreneurs who kind of wanted to have a place to hide and innovate for a while, but just develop products for Samsung. So it was called an accelerator. And it sort of operated in this really cool space, but you weren't a Samsung employee. Right. So you have to decide what you want and why you're being an entrepreneur and what you want to get out of that. And sometimes, if you're a first-time entrepreneur and you get those opportunities, it's worth it because it's a stepping stone for maybe what you're going to do next. You have this great story. You built out this, you know, you had this great growth. It was You had the support network behind you. It was funded. And you move on to your next thing. Uh, and you have this great success story. And you say, Samsung bought this great innovation I had. Um, but my biggest tip is just do your research and make sure that it's the right program for your company for the right reasons. And the same holds true of partnerships, right? Because mm -hmm. there's pros and cons for, and we've talked a lot about like the pros of partnerships and how you find a partnership, but we haven't talked, obviously you don't have the time to talk about what makes a good partnership, you know, and when are there times when we actually want to avoid having a partnership? And I think those same rules that you kind of guidelines you the game are really uh, relevant for all kinds of things, including partnerships. Yeah, for partnerships, for accelerators, for investors in general. Um, there are some that will just give you money. Is that going to change your game? So if it's not, is that check worth it? Maybe they're going to open a Rolodex of relationships for you that's much more valuable. Maybe they have operating experience that you don't have. Maybe they have a sales channel that you don't have. So really think about what you need out of it, whatever the situation is, whether it's a partnership, an accelerator, or an investor. Shona, you got a thought following there? <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, I'm kind of with that. But um, no, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, or weigh in on your question of is it, you know, for PR? Is it smoke and mirrors? And I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I've been with a few large companies. I don't think so. I think that it, there may be some of that. Like, hey, we want to, we want to do this because it's cool, and everyone else is doing this too. Um, but I also think. With what we're going through, it's something we spend too much, like a lot of time talking about, probably not a lot of enough time doing. But you're talking in, in the case of big companies who've been around for a while, you've got your processes and you've got pretty um, developed processes, pretty developed ways of doing things that have existed for years. We work with these types of agencies who create our ads and these guys do different types of ads and these guys buy media or whatever and that's just on the marketing end of it but you have very kind of ingrained ways of doing things and especially the bigger a company gets and the more global it gets it gets harder to break that stuff down you can't do it overnight that doesn't mean you don't want to do the new stuff and you're like really interested in it i want to do that i want to do that quicker smarter with less money yeah i want to do that but i can't break this down so whether you have an accelerator program or you can just get to the right people whether it's silicon valley outpost or you talk to the innovation person the marketing person um i think if you if if you pick your partners right if you know that this uh the, the, this company or this brand has, has been dabbling in this market um, or looking has have worked with a few startups, then I think that they're trying. So my point is, I think it's a way for big companies and big businesses to get their to get their feet wet with you know so that they can without having to collapse the existing structure that's going to take forever to kind of un, undo. So I would also say, if, you, if a company doesn't have an accelerator program, it doesn't mean they're not interested. It just means they probably haven't got the funding to do that yet. Awesome. We'll leave it on that. In case you were wondering, I was waving to a unicorn. I can say that. She's walking up. She can't hear me now. This woman who codes. All right. We'll leave it on that note. Um, I want to thank my incredible panel and my interloper. Thank you, Matt. Um, all of you, amazing. Thank you, friends, experts, awesomeness. Amazing. Thank you.